Decision for Life. Welcome to First Baptist Church Indian Trail. Bring surely goodness and mercy, verse 6, shall follow me all the days of my life, and uh, I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Um, powerful words. We, we are uh, winding now to uh, the conclusion of the 23rd Psalm, probably the most familiar passage of Scripture in all of the Bible, and in some ways the most powerful Scripture in the Bible. And one of the reasons that makes it so powerful is uh, it begins with the Lord and it ends with the Lord. The Lord is my shepherd. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Uh, so it's not about David. It's not about me. And it's not about you. It's all about Jesus. That's what makes this such a powerful passage of Scripture. Um, we've tried uh, these past few weeks. And I hope that you have uh, gleaned a little bit of something. But there are 12 things that jump out at us at what the Lord does for us as our shepherd. So maybe you go back sometime in these uh, holiday seasons, maybe in your quiet time, and just dig those 12 back out. What, what does that passage really say uh, about Jesus and what he does in my heart and in my life? Let me ask you a question. We, we, you know, we're facing some of the most difficult days that uh, any of us have ever lived in. There's so many unanswered questions that are out there right now. And uh, I, I wonder if I were to say to you, um, what's going to happen next week? What's going to happen next month? What do you think six months from now is going to look like? I wonder what were some of the first thoughts and some of the first emotions that you had in your life. I, I wonder if... When we talk about the future, uh, are, do you get anxious? Um, do you have uh, anxiety? And maybe there's even that element of fear. I, I don't think that I have ever seen more people disturbed by fear in all of my life than what I have seen in these last few months. We've been motivated by fear. Fear has a tactic that has tried to control and to manipulate and to maneuver people. And the enemy does that. He uses fear. I think fear is a major tool of Satan to um, keep us from being who God wants us to be. So I want to talk to you this morning from this text uh, how that you can face tomorrow and the future without being uh, afraid. Now, let me give you, first of all, I, I've broken this down into two different segments, and uh, I want to give you three reasons this morning why uh, you don't have to be afraid of the future. Uh, you ready? Say amen. All right, let's dig in. First of all, because of God's protection. Now, notice what he says. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. So he goes down into verse 6, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. When you see that surely goodness and mercy is following me all the days of my life, um, you, you have to come to grips with the fact that God notices you. He's aware of you. There are about 8 billion people on the planet right now. And the fact of the matter is, God gives 100% of his attention to all 8 billion people. You say, now, how in the world is that even possible? Well, he gives 100% of his attention to you. And if you don't understand that, then... Maybe the size of your God is way too small. Uh, maybe your perception of how big God is is a little bit warped because the fact of the matter is God knows every detail about your life. 
He knows your ins and your outs. He knows your ups and your downs. As a matter of fact, folks, he knows more about you than you know about yourself. There's nothing that escapes uh, his attention to you. Notice in Psalm 145, 20, the Bible says the Lord watches over all of them who love him. The beautiful thing is one of these days when you and I get into heaven, uh, we're going to see everything that God protected us from. Uh, we're going to see everything that would have created fear in our heart that never came to pass simply because that God intercepted it in our life. How, how does he do that? One of the ways is that uh, he sends his angels to watch over us and to protect us. Are you aware that you have angels that watch over you? Uh, the Bible tells us in Psalm 91, 11, God order, orders his angels to protect you wherever you go. Now, one of these days, I really ought to take a uh, lead off of Billy Graham and just... Uh, but he wrote one of the greatest books on angels ever. And uh, I'll, I'll just preach a sermon on angels because there's so many misconceptions and myths about angels. One of them is, is that when you die, you become an angel. That's a bunch of junk. Some of you are just dying to get your set of wings. It ain't happening. You see, angels are spirit beings. They're not physical beings uh, at all. But God created them to be encouragers to you and to protect you uh, in your life. Um, I'll give you a, a couple of examples where I believe angels um, intervened in my life. Uh, I was drafted in 1969, uh, right in the middle of the Vietnam War, uh, that should have never been fought to begin with. It was a meaningless war. Um, but uh, got drafted, and I'm in the middle of that, and I'm thinking as some of my friends and some of my um, uh, neighbors really were shot and killed, and I thought, you know what, I, I want to I go. So I volunteered. In the middle of my training, I volunteered to go. Uh, so I thought, well, if I'm going to go, let me make some money while I'm over there. So I I took some extra training to get rank so that while I'm over there not spending any money, I'll have some money when I get back. In November of 1969, I developed double pneumonia. Went to the doctor. They took the x-rays and uh, showed up. I was pretty sick. And uh, they gave me some medicine, got over it. And I was in uh, my on-job training segment of uh, just days, just days before I was to leave to go to Vietnam. And I was sitting at the, um, uh, in, in my office, in the S2 office at uh, OCS uh, Battalion in Fort Benning, Georgia. And my phone rang and there was a doctor on the other side. And, and, and now mind you, this is February, three months after my healing of double pneumonia. And uh, so I'm sitting there, he, he, he says, what are you doing? I said, well, I'm just sitting here doing my job. He said, you drop whatever you're doing and you get to my office immediately. Went over there. Now, three months. Now, those of you who know anything about the Army, uh, you, you know they're not the most organized people in the world. Somehow, some way, my x-ray shows up on a doctor's office desk. He looks at it and he says, who in the world does this belong to? And he chased it down and it was mine. They located me and he says to me, how in the world did you get in the army? I said, I was drafted. He said, did they not do an exam? And I said, well. He throws it up on the fluoroscope and that kind of dates everything there. And he says, your spine looks like a pretzel. How did you get in here? Now, let me just tell you, I believe an angel of God somehow shuffled that x-ray to wind up on that doctor's desk. He says to me, 
Got too much money tied up. And I've been in a year. Too much money tied up in you now to let you go home. We're going to send you to Fort Hood, Texas. At that time was the armpit of the world. I get out into Fort Hood, Texas. 30 days later, God gloriously saved my soul. Changed me by the power of his Holy Spirit. You say, coincidence? No. No. God orchestrated had an angel pull out an x-ray that was three months old, put it on some doctor's desk who followed up. The rest is history. I'll, I'll give you one more. I believe an angel interfered. I, I, it was in the around 1991, 92, somewhere along in there. And I'll be honest with you. I wanted to leave First Baptist Indian Trail. I was, I was just about up to here with everything and I'm ready to go. So I started calling my buddies and said, get me out of here, will you? I got to thinking after about six months, not one church called, not one search committee. Nobody followed up. And I'm thinking, I don't have a friend in the world. Well, we got through that season. And uh, about two or three years after that, I was visiting in a home that had a death. Matter of fact, it was in the Hamrick's home down in Shelby. And uh, this guy, big old tall, lanky guy came up to me and I introduced myself. He said, I know who you are. He was just real kind of hateful with me, sharp. I know who you are. I said, how do you know me? He said, I was the uh, search committee chairman at Bethel Church in Shelby. And we sent you a letter uh, two years ago and we wanted you to be our pastor. And you didn't even have the courtesy to answer our letter. I said, sir, I never got your letter. You say, coincidence? Nah. I believe an angel of the Lord showed up over at the U.S. post office and lost that letter is what I think because I'd have got out of the will of God. I'll just tell you. Angels, I, I believe, are one of the ways that God leads us and guides us. Surely, goodness and mercy will follow me all of the days of my life. You say, what does that mean? Does that mean that uh, for a uh, person that everything is going to turn, is, is going to be good, to, that's going to ever happen? No, no, no. All you got to do is look at the writer of this. David is writing. He's not saying everything is going to be good to, to me. Everything, everything I go through is going to be good. I'm going to like it. No, it's not what he said. He said that everything here is going to, wind up for your good if the Lord is your shepherd. Uh, so not everything is going to happen good to you, but something good will come from it. Now, some of you are sitting here this morning and you're going through some of the most difficult seasons of your life. You're in the middle of a crisis and I promise you, you can't see that principle when you are in the midst of a crisis. Can't see it. You're blinded to it. I remember Kathy and I, six months ago, were going through the biggest crisis when our grandson died of fentanyl overdose. It wasn't good. I'll just tell you this right now. That's still not a good thing. Our prayer immediately became, oh God, this is horrible. But would you uh, please, God, bring something good out of it? You say, Pastor, is anything good coming out of it? Absolutely. Yes. Yes. Every day we're seeing something that God is taking that bad situation and he's blending it in with other things and he is producing good from it. Let me give you number two. Uh, because of God's protection and provision, but also because of God's pardon, you can face the future without fear because of God's pardon. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all of the days of my life. Look at those two words, goodness. That's God giving to me things that I don't deserve. 
Would you sit for a minute or two and just think about your own life right now and all of the blessings that have come your way that you have absolutely no right to think that you deserve to have it? We don't deserve the air that we breathe. We don't deserve the blessings that come from God to us. We don't deserve his grace gifts that he pours into our life. We don't deserve to live in this country. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all of the days uh, of my life. What is mercy? Mercy is just the opposite of that. It's withholding that which I do deserve. The fact of the matter is, friends, we all deserve death, hell, and the grave. We don't deserve the goodness of God. But God doesn't give us what we deserve. We all mess up. We all blow it from time to time. We all deserve punishment and discipline and retribution. Fact of the matter is, if I got what I deserved, I wouldn't be here today. Can I get a witness from anybody? If I got what I deserved, I wouldn't be able to take the next breath. But the Bible says these two will follow you. God's grace, God's goodness, and God's mercy. And the Bible says that he's just going to forgive all of the bads in my life, all of my life. Why do you need the mercy of God? Because the Bible says we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. We live in a broken world and we need his forgiveness on our life every day. I, I'm just grateful for this, Jay. I don't know about you, but I'm, I'm glad today that I am followed with the goodness and mercy of God rather than the justice of God. Be a different life, wouldn't it? Thank God for his mercy. I want you to look with me. Um, I'm going to take a little bit more time here this morning than I normally would, but I want you to look at Psalm 103 and uh, look at verse 2. <clears throat> you, you really want to see God's goodness and mercy. Take a little time today and just read this passage. It says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. And then you can go down and just maybe underline and circle and highlight somewhere along the way all of the benefits that God has given uh, to you. He forgives our iniquity. He heals our, re our diseases. He redeems our life. He crowns us with kindness and mercy. He satisfies us in our life. And on and on and on it goes throughout uh, verse 13. And here's the beautiful part about it. Because of God's goodness and his mercy, any time of the day, 24-7, you can go to God and seek his face for forgiveness of your sin, no matter who you are. The Bible says, let us come boldly, in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16, before the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy in our time of need. I, I like what he says here. He says, uh, Surely goodness and mercy shall what? Follow me. Do you remember I told you sheep have to be led. You can't drive sheep like cows and horses. They have to be led. So God's put in two sheep dogs in behind us. And, and, and one's called puppy goodness and the other one is called puppy mercy. And they're just right in behind us and, and they're nipping at our heels to keep us uh, on the right track. I, I kind of like it. I, I look out and I see so many of you mamas and, and got little children here and little babies. It, it, it's, it's these mamas. And, and, and you get another metaphor here with, with uh, goodness and mercy L like these mamas and they're following their toddlers all day long and those toddlers, every step they take, they're making a mess and, and, and they're le leaving behind awake and you can just see that little mama, she's picking up this and she's cleaning up this and she's wiping this and she's, that's the way God's doing with us with goodness and mercy as we're making our way. He's like that little mama that's cleaning up the mess of our life and to keep it us where we need to be. Follow us all the days of our life. You say, well, preacher, um, I, don't, I just don't really feel that goodness and I really don't feel that mercy. Well, whoop-de-doo. 
Where in the world do you get that from? Huh? There's nothing here in the scriptures that say that you have to feel anything. Uh, we're just exposing here the faithfulness of the shepherd to do for us what we cannot do for ourselves. And God's good whether you ever feel it or not. And it's not about you and it's not about me. It's about him and his faithfulness. Now, let me give you number three. Because of God's promise, he says, uh, we don't have to fear the future. I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Boy, I want to tell you, this is a powerful word. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. Now watch that little conjunctive word, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. You, you understand, as long as we're here on this earth, God says my goodness and my mercy is going to chase after you. But don't be afraid to die because death is nothing but a transition from here to there. And he says, you're going to dwell in the house of the Lord. That's his promise to you forever and ever. That means I don't have to be afraid to die simply because life for us as a believer when the Lord is our shepherd, life just keeps getting better and better along the way. And thank God one of these days we're going to be in that land where there'll be no more sorrow. There'll be no more sickness. There'll be no more pain. There'll be no more death. There'll be no more separation. God has determined in that new Jerusalem. Next Sunday, I'm going to be preaching on heaven. Uh, what makes heaven heaven? Well, what makes heaven heaven is because it's home to the fullness of the glory of the Lord. In the book of Psalms, the Bible says the heavens declare the glory of God. God is so creative. I, I love this time of year. Uh, and, and I love it like it's been here lately. There's no clouds in the sky. You could go out in the night. And, and the brilliance of the stars and the moon and you can see the creativeness of God and you can declare in the heavens itself of the glory of God and you look at the myriad of numbers of plant life that God gloriously created and you can see the glory of God but oh one of these days as they sang a few minutes ago I hath not seen ear hath not heard neither has it entered into the heart of any of us that are here this morning what God has prepared for us when we get over onto the other side it's going to be an amazing display of the glory of God. Down here, we just get a little glimpse of the glory of God. But one of these days when he carries us home to be with him, we'll see him in all of his glory. Oh, Stephen, when they were throwing and hurling those stones at him, just before he died, he looked up, Acts chapter 7, and he saw the glory of heaven. The Bible tells us in John chapter 12 that Jesus returned to the glory of heaven. You know what? We don't have a clue because we're just looking through a glass dimly right now. But oh, one of these days, we're going to be with him face to face. Now until then, let me give you three things, okay? How you're supposed to live until... God transitions us out of this life into the next. Number one, we ought to live a life where we focus on being thankful. You, you hear my heart just a minute. If you want an antidote to fear, if you want to deal with fear, learn to be thankful. Because fear and thankfulness cannot coexist in the same person. The Bible says, oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good and his mercy endures forever. 
In other words, his mercy is never going to run out. His goodness is never going to run out. I told you last Sunday that if you weren't really want to live a more healthy, longer life, then learn how to be thankful. We just came through that thanksgiving period. Have you ever looked at that compound word, thanksgiving? If you're living a thankful life, it inevitably is going to live to a giving life. They go hand in hand. God said to you and to me, I've been good to you so that I want you now to be good to others. The Bible says freely you have received, so freely give. You see, listen to this. The more generous that you become, the less fearful that you are. Why is that? The more generous you are is the more focus of attention that you are giving to God and to others. And you get that focus of attention off of yourself. When you get your focus of attention on you, you inevitably are going to wind up living a fearful life. Psalm chapter 112. Turn over there with me, would you? Real quick. Psalm 112. And uh, I want you to look with me at verse number 5. Psalm 112, verse 5. Now watch this, if you will. Just kind of break it down. A good man, and, and he's talking about a generous man here or a righteous man. A good man shows favor. In other words, he's generous and lendeth. He will guide his affairs with discretion. Um, surely he shall not be moved forever, for the righteous shall be an everlasting remembrance. He shall not be afraid of evil tidings. Uh, you know, he's not going to worry about what the front page says or uh, the, the, the next press conference. His heart is fixed, trusting in the Lord. His heart is established. He shall not be afraid until he sees the desires of his enemies. Watch this. He hath dispersed. He's been very generous and giving. He's given to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. His horn shall be exalted with honor. Now, I wouldn't dare embarrass anybody uh, intentionally, but I spent some time this week with a guy, and, uh, about two hours, and uh, he looked over at me and he said, uh, hey, I've been... Uh, I've been practicing what you've been preaching. Now that shocks me anytime I hear that, I just tell you. He says, I've been practicing what you've been preaching. He said, you've been talking about being generous and giving. And he said, I've been doing that. And kind of got quiet for a little while. And then he built on that and told me the enormous way in which God, through his faithfulness, had honored his word and poured out blessings on his life that was unbelievable. I want to give you a little challenge here today to all of you. Every morning when you wake up, before you ever get out of the bed, why don't you just lie there for a moment and just think about some of the things that you ought to be thankful for. Start your day out there. Just make your mental list. God, God, I just thank you for this and I thank you for that. And just let your mind dwell on all of the blessings, the goodness and the mercy that God has extended to you. And God, you've been good to me. You've been generous to me. Let me give you the second one. You ready? Um, what you ought to do between now and the time that God takes you to his house is that you ought to forgive willingly. Ephesians 4.32 says, Be ye kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake has forgiven you. Let, let me ask you, look this way to me. Everybody look this way just a minute. Has God let you off the hook? If God has let you off the hook, and he's forgiven you? How come you holding somebody else still on the hook? Well, what right do you, if you've been forgiven of so much, 
What right do any of us have not to forgive others? Why are you still holding on to that? Um, I'm going to tell you something. You need to learn that forgiving and letting people off the hook will keep you from living a life of fear. Listen, Listen to this verse. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear because fear hath torment or punishment. You understand, when you let love in the front door, fear's got to go out the back. But if you let fear come in the front door, love goes out the back. They can't live in the same house. So, so maybe you ought to get to the place that you, here's, here's what I think. Here's what I think. Unforgiven people are unforgiving And the reason that a lot of people still hold other people on the hook is because they're living themselves in shame and in guilt and in unforgiveness and they want everybody else around them to feel the same way that they feel. And so they don't give forgiveness because they've never experienced forgiveness. But if the Lord is your shepherd, and he's cast your sin as far as the east is from the west. Don't you think that you need, if you've been forgiven much, don't you need to forgive much? And then finally, you ought to finish well. Uh, Matthew five sixteen says, let your light so shine before men. Here's such an important part of that verse. That they may see your good works. And glorify your Father who is in heaven. When you're living for God, you're giving God glory. God gets glory when you live for Him. And when you live for Him and He gets the glory, guess what happens? There's more goodness and there's more mercy that comes your way. I'm convinced with all of my heart, one of the most powerful verses of Scripture in all of the New Testament is is one of my favorites, uh, if not my favorite. Uh, It's 2 Peter 1, verse 3. God has given to you and to me everything that we will ever need to live godly. Let me say that again. God's already given everything that you will ever need so that you could live your life for him. And one of these days, I don't know when it's going to be, I believe it's a whole lot sooner than most of us ever realize, but one of these days we're going to be called on to share in his goodness and in his glory. All right, let's go back to the very beginning of the sermon. When you look to the future, whether it's next week or next month or the next six months. What do you see? Do you see fear? Do you see anxiety? Do you see doubt, confusion? If that's true in your life, then what, what it really means is that you're, you're really not focused on Psalm 23, 6. When the goodness of God and his mercy meets and supplies every need that you're going to have every day of your life. What do you think is going to make you happy? What do you think is going to make you? Focusing in on yourself or focusing in on the shepherd? The Lord is my shepherd. It begins that way. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. But the only way that you, listen, the only way that you're ever going to dwell in the house of the Lord forever is for the Lord to be your shepherd. Now I want to ask you a question. Where were you when Jesus became your shepherd? Do you remember? 
That, that's life change. It's the biggest day of your life, bar none. You may not remember the day or the date, but you ought to remember where you were. That's where your sin was forgiven. That's where the Bible says that God made you a new creation. And if you can't remember where you were, in all probability, it's never happened. And you need a place, and it can be right here, and you need a time, and it can be right now. If you want Jesus to be your shepherd so that you can dwell in the house of the Lord forever, I want you to bow with me in prayer right now all over the building. Would you do that? Every head bowed and every eye closed. Would you pray something like this with me and really mean it? Heavenly Father, I do believe that Jesus Christ died on a cross for my sin. I do believe that he rose from the dead on that third day. Father, I know that I'm a sinner. And my sin has separated me from you. Please forgive me of my sin. Right now, I receive you into my heart and into my life. Thank you for watching Decision for Life. Our location, life group, and program information are available online at fpcit.org. We hope you will take the opportunity to join us in person. Thank you from the family of First Baptist Church Indian Trail.